I'm Steve Reinhardt. I'm your host. We're in the studio today. I'm here with Kyle 2K, weekday host, and Trevor Bluefer, good friends of mine. This is a show where you touch history, culture, politics, and religion collide. We tell you everything you never knew you wanted to know, from the fascinating and obscure to fresh and far-reaching. You can find it here. We have the author of a best-selling new biography on Joseph Smith with us today, Richard Lyman Bushman. We hope that none of you are working like we are today, that you're all out enjoying the Christmas holiday. My vacation was yesterday and the day before I flew down with my younger brother to Las Vegas. We saw our other younger brother down there who just finished finals at UNLV Law School. But like I said, we have a great show for you today. We're very happy to be here. Professor Bushman is with us on the air. His book is available for sale on Amazon.com. You can find it there or any, any place books are sold, particularly here locally. Barnes & Noble, Borders, Desert Books, Siegel Book, they've all got it. We're especially grateful to have him on the air with us today because yesterday was the 200th anniversary of Joseph Smith's birth. It's also Christmas Eve today, and we appreciate him taking that time out of his schedule to be with us. We'll, we'll put him on in just a second. We have a list of questions here that we've collected from a variety of different people, young deacons all the way up to biographers of other church prophets, such as David O. McKay, and we'll pose them all to Professor Bushman here on the air. And let's go to him now. Professor Bushman, are you there? Yes, indeed. Thank you for being with us on the air. We're very honored to have you here. Happy to be here. I have a copy of your book in front of me. I've spent the last two or three days reading it, and as has uh, Trevor Bluford, who's here in the studio with us also. We'd like to ask you some open-ended questions about the book, and then some more specific questions as we move through the interview. First of all, what inspired you to write this book? It's the most comprehensive book on Joseph Smith's life that I've ever read, and I've read several. Well, I've uh, been a Mormon all my life. I was attached to the church, and I've been a historian. Uh, since I began graduate school. So I always had in the back of my mind that um, I ought to do something on Joseph Smith sooner or later because my field was early American social and cultural history. And then with the, the 200th anniversary came, coming up, I thought, well, this is the moment. So um, in 1997, I plunged in and got to work. Now, I didn't tell uh, our listeners before we started you are a history professor at Columbia University in New York, and I have a, a bio here. Uh, you you are the you grew up in Portland, Oregon. You earned your undergraduate and graduate degrees from Harvard. You taught at Brigham Young University, Boston University, University of Delaware. You've written several books, including From Puritan to Yankee, Character and Social Order in Connecticut, uh, Joseph Smith and the Beginnings of Mormonism. I received several awards. So you wrote this book uh, in anticipation of Joseph Smith's 200th birthday and uh, got it out on time for that. Didn't you? So you spent eight years writing this, this well, work. Well, yeah, I had to finish it up by 2004, so it took about seven years. We have uh, heard almost nothing but positive comments about it. To, to start with some of the open-ended questions, what was the most surprising thing that you found out about Joseph Smith's life while writing this book? Well, there were a number of things that um, surprised me, even though I'd been involved, uh, more or less, in Joseph Smith's history. One was um, how little he figured in the church missionary program for the first decade or so. Uh, the missionaries, so far as we can tell, would never mention Joseph Smith's name. Uh, the story of the first vision was not widely known in the church until after Joseph Smith began writing his history in earnest in uh, 1838-39. And uh, we often think that Mormonism was a product of his charismatic personality. And in a sense, that's true, and that he did bind people to him. They were immensely loyal, uh, many of his followers. But uh, for the most part, the missionaries went out with the message that had to do with uh, the restoration of the gospel and not necessarily with Joseph Smith. Has your perspective on Joseph Smith changed in, in writing this book? Well, I had sort of roughly suspected something of that sort, but then when I got into the materials talking about how the missionary program worked, it became 
more evident to him. So, yeah, I would say I was I was surprised. I was surprised about certain things in his personality. I I was interested that he did. He was like Abraham Lincoln. He had a kind of melancholy side that we don't ordinarily see because he's so confident, even brash, and certainly bold, uh, both in what he taught and sort of his personal manner. But there were times when he brooded about death, and, and especially when he was alone, he would become uh, quite blue and write to his wife about the, the sorrows that came bubbling up inside him. You, you write about several controversial subjects in your book about Joseph Smith. You have, you talk about polygamy in there. You have uh, uh, the King Follett discourse is discussed. I read the section on that. Uh, the lost 116 pages are discussed. Were the lost 116 pages, do you think they'll ever be found? Well, we don't know much about them at all. We, we know roughly the time period that was covered. It apparently was a story of the migration of Lehi and his family and uh, getting established. It was the Book of Lehi, is that correct? Well, yeah, it was um, right. That's, that's correct. So it, it covered that period that his son Nephi then later said he, would, uh, he was going to give another version of it that was more spiritual rather than, than uh, political. And, you know, there was a, one of the Mark Hoffman's forgeries referred to some of the things in that book, uh, which gave us a little clue, but then turned out to be a false lead. So we don't really know what was in those 116 pages. Was Mark Hoffman in the process of forging those lost 116 pages? <laughs> you expect me to have an answer to that? What, what was the reference in his documents to, to the Book of Lehi? Was it another document that he forged that had a reference to, to the lost 116 pages? It was a uh, letter of um, Lucy Max Smith, I think, to a sister or some relative, making some reference to uh, the early translation and what was in there spoke of... Um, conspiratorial bands or something um, operating in Jerusalem and, and help that ex to explain why the I had to leave. Do you think the church would be different had Joseph Smith not been killed? It's uh, a good question and hard to ask. Everyone wants to uh, uh, trace a trajectory and, and point to where Joseph was going. It is a fact that uh, he kept thinking that he had reestablished the church as it was to be. That is, he'd restored everything that needed to be known and would say, now, now I've given you everything, now all we have to do is carry on with what we have. And then something new would come, and he then was, had this terribly urgent need to uh, install it among the members, whether it was temple work or priesthood or church organization or whatever. So it's, it's hard to believe that he would have stopped uh, receiving revelations. But what they would have been, I, I think it would be just pure guesswork. How do the perspectives of the other churches that believe in Joseph Smith, uh, how are they different from the Mormon view? You have the RLDS Church, which I believe is now called the Church of Christ. It's and called the Community of Christ. The Community of Christ, that's right. And then you also have the Strangites, who I know very little about, but I've heard a little bit about. Mm -hmm. Is their view of Joseph Smith similar to the to the Mormon view of Joseph Smith? Well, I know nothing about the uh, modern day Strangites, so I can't comment on that. The Community of Christ is um, going through transition now, and there's quite a disagreement about where Joseph Smith stands. They've always been. Um, from their beginning, reluctant to accept uh, all the Nauvoo doctrines, especially polygamy in the temple, of course. I think now there are many people who recognize Joseph Smith taught polygamy and practiced polygamy. Uh, but there's a tendency, at least among the intellectuals whom I know best, to kind of not just reject those doctrines, but Joseph Smith as a whole in that period and think he really went off the track. So, so far as I can tell, there's a kind of a downplaying. There's an effort to 
find out what are the Joseph Smith legacy they want to hold on to, but a great tendency to move back more towards conventional Protestant doctrines and more sort of moral principles uh, rather than the distinctive Joseph Smith doctrines. So I think the Mormons are quite unusual in having held on to Joseph Smith and believe that he, uh, he was indeed the prophet right through to the day of his death. Would the saints have come west had Joseph Smith not died? I think so. They were thinking westward. Joseph knew that their days in Illinois were numbered. He was really terrified that Missouri was going to be repeated again. And uh, so in that spring before he died, 1844, they were planning to send out uh, exploratory groups to move up and down the Pacific coast and try to find some other location. So I think it's pretty certain they would have they would have gone eventually. He predicted that the saints would come west in a famous prophecy. Did he actually predict that the saints would come west to the Rocky Mountains, or was that wording added to that prophecy later? Well, I haven't made a close study of that one, but what I do know is that in his own lifetime, there are not records kept at the time of him that they would move there. There were. Things were, I would just say that there's a whole category of things that are recorded 10 or 20 years later, which tended to confirm uh, what had happened and say Joseph Smith foresaw it. I think it's quite possible he did predict it, but it wasn't recorded in that period immediately around his life, and um, I don't think you get anyone else at that time making plans other than to explore the West, looking for a site where the saints could go. What, what resources did you have writing this book that other scholars lacked? I didn't have a thing that other scholars lacked. Uh, everything I have is in the public domain. That's actually a requirement of um, scholarship. You can't cite unavailable sources uh, because that, then there's no check on what you say. And uh, a good deal of what I used is uh, available in a published form or on CD. Huge number of journals are on New Mormon Studies or Gospel Link. So I actually spent very little time in the archives simply because everything was right here in my own office, uh, available online or on CD. Did you tend to focus on certain pieces of information that perhaps other scholars had overlooked? Well, it's hard to give a, a, an answer to that. I felt like I was reading his correspondence more closely than it had been done before. These are now available in this fabulous edition uh, edited by Dean Jesse of Joseph Smith's Personal Writings. And since so many things are seen through the mind of a clerk or the mind of someone who is nearby, I particularly valued the things that I felt like he had really dictated himself or written in his, in his own hand. So I tried to squeeze every bit of information I could out of those, uh, those letters. And then, of course, his journals, Most, many of which were dictated or written by him. Some, like Richard's diary, uh, was really it's someone at his elbow writing things down. But uh, that was my basic material. Uh, the correspondence in the journals. Let me throw out the phone numbers really quickly. We were having some technical problems with the lines this morning. Here in Salt Lake, the numbers, for listeners who want to call in with questions for Professor Bushman, 254-5855, Ogden 670-5855, and Provo 470-5855. We're talking with Professor Richard Lyman Bushman. He's a professor of history at Columbia University. He's written a book, Joseph Smith, Rough Rolling Stone. It's a bestseller published by Not Publishing, a large East Coast publisher. You, you mentioned that you were familiar with the community of Christ and not as familiar with the Strangites. Do the Strangites own the cornerstones of the Independence Temple? And that's something that's mentioned, I think, in your book. Is, is, that, is that a plot of land that the church has tried to buy and is trying to get back? Well, uh, by the way, let me uh, get straight the title. It's um, 
Joseph Smith, Rough Stone Rolling. Oh, Rough Rolling. I'm sorry. <laughs> rough Stone Rolling. I have it here in front of me, and I'm looking at so many, so many different things. All right, that's a quote from Bill Uh There is a group, uh, a small uh, splinter group, that owns the actual temple site uh, in Independence, Missouri. And um, if there are indeed cornerstones, they would be owned by that group. But that's not Strainites. Strainites, uh, again, in Michigan. Uh, this is a group that uh, is right in Missouri. How did the Pearl of Great Price get its name? And did, did Joseph Smith name that, the, that volume of scripture, the Pearl of Great Price? No, Joseph didn't name that. Um, the, the book did not exist uh, when he was alive. He produced uh, the various elements in that book, Book of Moses, Book of Abraham, and retranslation of Matthew 24, plus his own history. But it was published uh, in Britain initially uh, by uh, Franklin D. Richards, if I remember correctly, in the 1850s. And he gave it the name, and of course it comes from the New Testament. So it's not Joseph's uh, device at all. Was a picture of Joseph Smith found by the reorganized church? There have been photograph? No, no photographs. There, um, there have been some candidates uh, and you know possibilities, but nothing has really been firmly authenticated as a Joseph Smith uh, photograph. So I think we have to go with the death, death mask and then these Sutcliffe Maudsley profiles which were done uh, during his lifetime. And a little bit of a caricature, that is, they're not precisely accurate, but uh, they give us an idea of, of how he looked. One but, of which you have on the cover of your book. Yeah, I love it. It's, uh, uh, it's actually more beautiful than it appears on the cover. It's too small on the cover. But uh, Monsley did a pair, Joseph Smith um, holding the Bible and uh, Hiram Smith, uh, holding the Doctrine and Covenants, and they're, they're just beautiful, I think. The paper's a little bit modeled now, and, and uh, combine that with this sharp line, and I think they're beautiful. Were Joseph and Hiram's graves mixed up? Boy, I've never heard that. I, they were, people were unsure of where they were for a while, but uh, that's not what I've, I've heard about. I, I guess uh, there's been a couple people under the impression that they're uncertain which one is which for sure. They think they know, but they're not 100% certain. Yeah. Well, they'd have to ask uh, the people in the community of Christ if they're un uncertain about it. None of them have ever mentioned that to me. What artifacts from Joseph Smith's life are are still missing from museums, and uh, is the Mormon Church most anxious to get a hold of? Are there, are there any that, that come to mind in particular? They got the death masks from uh, the Wood Museum in Bountiful. Right. Does the Wood Museum still have artifacts there that the church would like to have? Well, I don't know what the church's uh, collection policy is. I'm sure they would welcome donations of anything connected with Joseph Smith. Artifacts are difficult. Um, unless they're in professional hands and carefully documented uh, down to uh, 150 years, you never know for sure if they were actually in his possession. You get family traditions about uh, about lots of things. Uh, so you presume. But uh, there's a, quite a number of these floating around, especially in the position of Edward G. Smith and that family, which are highly honored and thought to go back, go back to Joseph Smith. Whether or not he'll donate them to the church, um, remains to be seen. What has the response to your book been, both from LDS readers and non-LDS readers? Well, all I can go by are people coming up to me and reviews and uh, that sort of thing. And my impression is that um, a, a large number of Latter-day Saint readers find it refreshing. They feel like they get a more candid picture and maybe a more believable picture 
Joseph Smith than they've seen before. I've had a certain number of Latter-day Saints who were shocked and feel like I am too negative and want to know um, what about all the praise of Joseph Smith, which I try to include, but um, try to give both sides of the picture. Uh, Non-Mormons uh, vary, but in a slightly different direction. Some think it's, it, again, it's a refreshing picture, and uh, illuminating. Others think that, um, uh, that Joseph Smith really was a fraud beyond any question, especially as demonstrated by the claim to have gold plates and the claim to take plural wives. And they can't see beyond that. There was a review in the New York Review of Books by the novelist Larry McMurtry that really couldn't see anything in Joseph Smith except those two features. And so I have the feeling that some people come to Joseph Smith with very fixed ideas of who he was. And my book doesn't uh, jolt them out of that preconception. And uh, so they probably don't think very much of what I've done. What? part of Joseph Smith's life do you think contributes most to this perception that he was a fraud? What's most problematic? Is it polygamy? Is it the Book of Abraham? Is it the Book of Mormon and the Golden Plates? Or perhaps some of Joseph Smith's uh, activities before he became a prophet and started the church? I think it's probably the first group that you mentioned um, ever since he first published the Book of Mormon. It was immediately described as a uh, as a, a hoax and him as an imposter. So that in itself uh, set him up to be um, criticized. And then, of course, at the end of the life, his life as rumors of polygamy went around, people were very skeptical, thinking he was just uh, sort of rationalizing his own, own lust. And the Book of Abraham was not very well known in his own time, and, but has come under attack pretty much steadily since the late 19th century, and of course the discovery of the fragments of the Abraham manuscripts um, seemed to some people conclusive evidence that Joseph Smith was just pretending to translate. So that's a, that's a big issue. Uh, and I would say those, those three right now are the hot button items for criticizing Joseph Smith. And Farms has spent a lot of time Hugh Nibley debunking some of those Book of Abraham issues and the Golden Plate type issues. Farms, for those of you who don't know, is a uh, extension of BYU now that, uh, that writes more, how would you describe it, Professor Bushman, uh, just technical papers about the church and, and explaining from a uh, rational point of view, some of these, some of the, these types of issues. Well, they try to examine Joseph Smith's uh, ancient writings, the ones that purported to be ancient histories, and especially the Book of Abraham and um, the Book of Mormon, and try to see evidence of uh, historical authenticity, and then they try to respond to questions uh, from the critics, and they they have indeed. Um, they've come out with the position, which I agree with, actually, that we can't really claim, even as believing Mormons, that Joseph Smith translated in the sense of looking at a character and then trying to figure out what it meant, writing that down, and then moving on to the next character the way an ordinary translator would work. He didn't do that with the Book of Mormon. He wasn't even looking at the plates. Well, he translated the Book of Mormon. And apparently the Book of Abraham, when he received it, was sort of an occasion for a revelation about the life of Abraham. So I think for believing Mormons, um, what has to be examined, I'd say for anyone who wants to take this book seriously, uh, is what kind of a book work did he produce? Here is a, an apocryphal story of Abraham, stories that don't appear in the Bible and would be known by Joseph Smith. And the interesting thing is, as the farms people point out, is that there's a huge body of apocryphal stories of Abraham that have been discovered in the last century or so. And many of the elements of Joseph's account correspond with the overall structure and the elements on these other apocryphal accounts. 
So there's another kind of historical authenticity that can be discerned if you look at it from that perspective. Did you feel like writing this book that there was any, any part of the, excuse me, the book that you left out uh, because of your Mormon faith? Any uh, subject that you shied away from in the book? Well, in a way, I couldn't because um, since I announced myself as a Mormon, I'm setting myself as, up as a target for, for bias. And there may be parts that I've uh, left out, but it wasn't because I wanted to cover things up. That's exactly what I couldn't do. But for reasons of the structure of the book, I don't talk about every plural wife, for example, and their struggles in, in uh, accepting Joseph Smith as a husband. And some people think I, sh I should have covered them all, and I sort of did a representative group and thought, well, that's about all a reader can take, and it sort of shows the overall pattern. Yeah. And um, someone has accused me of I'm not mentioning that uh, when Joseph Smith's family was selling refreshments in Palmyra, uh, I said they were beverages. They said the fact is they were selling beer. And uh, said there's a sure sign that Bushman is covering up the hard facts. But the, but the word of wisdom didn't come out until after that time, is that right? That's correct. So, you know, we have no brief for the Smiths not selling beer early on. We know Joe Smith Sr. was a drank wine, sometimes got uh, drunk, and I deal with that in the book. And with the quick survey that we took, most people that had read the book felt like you were very comprehensive, that you covered all the subjects, good and bad. We had one comment uh, that said you seemed to gloss over some of the uh, questionable behaviors in Joseph Smith's early life as far as looking for treasure. I think they had read uh, Michael Quinn's book um, about Mormonism. Did, is that the subject that, uh, it, it is a subject that you cover in the book, but is that something that um, you could have got more into? I really don't think so. I, I uh, had made no effort to cover things up. There is a disagreement about interpretation of his treasure-seeking activities. Uh, there are some people, Dan Vogel, for example, and Michael Quinn, who think Joseph Smith was an enthusiastic treasure seeker, that he hoped to make a career of treasure seeking, and uh, was out soliciting business and was really gung-ho for it. I don't read it that way. I think Joseph Smith did have a gift. He looked in a seer stone. He could find lost objects, and he did this for people. And I see his father as the enthusiastic treasure seeker who was bringing Joseph Smith into the picture. And uh, then about 1826, even Joseph Sr., realizing that Joseph had another kind of mission that was more religious and spiritual rather than monetary, and begin to, to back off. Uh, and others say, no, he continued on right up to the organization of the church and always uh, practiced magic from there on. I, I'm willing to admit he didn't repudiate magic, but I just think it became a very minor feature of his cultural life uh, after 1826 or 27. So it's not a matter of denying entirely, it's just a question of emphasis. You talk in the book about Joseph Smith's genealogy, about his father, some of his forebears. Is it true that Joseph Smith is related fairly closely to um, some other uh, political, religious figures, including George Bush, Colin Powell, <laughs> so that, that they've all come down from the same line? Is that correct? Boy, I've never, I've never heard that one. That, uh, that's, there's such a fascination with Joseph Smith that people really want to talk him up to everything that's significant in the world, but uh, I've never seen evidence of that kind. We're told there's actually a family tree in the Joseph Smith Memorial Building that shows his lineage for about seven generations back and then down a couple different lines to some of those, uh, some of those people. Well, that's quite possible. 
but that's true for about everybody in the world. If you go back seven generations, you probably are related to every last person. Joseph Smith had several brothers, one of whom died, and he suggested sometimes, a couple times during his life, that perhaps his brothers would have been better at what he was doing than himself, and maybe that they had all been foreordained, in a sense, for the responsibility that he had. Is there any truth to that? Is, were his brothers as important as he was, or potentially as important as he was to, the, to Mormonism? Well, the brothers were important, especially Hiram, of course, but uh, uh, he he had a great respect, as all of the family did for Alvin, the first son to live in the family, and then Alvin dies young and leaves a huge gap, uh, and Joseph always missed his, his older brother, Alvin, but Alvin according to the family law, had encouraged Joseph Smith uh, in translating the plates and following the angel's instructions. So I don't, I don't think there was ever any sense that Joseph uh, was sort of the second, like the Kennedy brothers said, when one falls, the next one steps up. I think he was the, the spiritual uh, pioneer uh, from the very beginning and remained through, right through to the end. His mother always felt like it was a family affair. After Joseph died, she thought uh, William should be made patriarch of the church and then subsequently president, but he was a little too erratic to be qualified. Was Emma as supportive of Joseph Smith as she should have been, in your opinion? I think she went... Um, uh, Maybe not all the way, but she is a heroic figure in my estimation. She, I think there was real love and affection there. I think Joseph confided in her. She was called by revelation to be his consolation. That was his, her church call, according to a revelation in the Doctrine and Covenants, to console her husband. And when you think of it, no one bore a more avid, a more complete testimony than she did, because when he was still in his early years and part money digger, part prophet, she gave her life to him. And she stuck by him right up through to the uh, polygamy, which just... Uh, she could not stomach. She did her best for a couple of weeks. She allowed Joseph to marry four other women. But uh, she just couldn't go that last step. Uh, but she, they remained married, and she loved him to the end. When he died, she cut off a locket of his hair, a lock of his hair, and wore it in a locket all of her life. So I think it was a very strong marriage myself. Now, she's been criticized by some for not coming west with the saints and for remarrying the non-member, also for not joining the church immediately after it was formed. Is there any truth to those to those kinds of claims, or do you feel that she was that she was under pressures that uh, that that uh, justified that type of thing? Well, she's been she was criticized. I, I don't think this business about being slow to join means big difference, but she didn't come west. She was alienated after Joseph's death. I think mainly she was worried about control of property, and she didn't quite trust Brigham Young and thought that he was going to claim property that was hers as belonging actually to the church. So there was a coolness that developed there, and then, of course, she didn't go west. But Later in her life, her son, Joseph III, who was then president of the reorganized church, interviewed her, and she gave a very firm and hard-headed and detailed testimony about the translation of the Book of Mormon that made it very clear she believed he was inspired, that he could not have written the book himself. So I think her testimony is one of the most powerful that was born. I would just say this, anyone who heard the... Um, the anniversary celebration from the church last night would have noted that Elder Packer in the opening prayer offered a prayer for Emma Smith as well as for Joseph. What about 
the uh, Mormon connection to uh, masonry? Is there that's disturbing for some people. You talk about that a little bit in the book. How much connection and overlap do you feel like there was? There was some. Uh, Harm and probably Joseph Sr. Uh, were Masons in the mid-1820s, and the Masons fell in very hard times during the anti-Masonic political movement of the late 20s and 30s. They began to revive in the 40s, and Mormons uh, opened a lodge in Nauvoo, and many Mormons became Masons, and Joseph among them. And uh, there are similarities between certain portions of the Temple Endowment and the Freemasonry. But my view on it is uh, that Joseph Smith's uh, religious inquiries and inspiration were spurred by a number of stimuli. It might be scripture, it might be something he saw in life. I think he was very attracted to masonry for a short period, both for political reasons and because of its high ideals. And uh, out of this, uh, I think, though we don't know the process, he could easily have sought inspiration to know the meaning for Mormons and the temple endowment came as a result. So I think it's foolish to say there's no connection, uh, but there's nothing shameful about uh, masonry having been the starting point for parts of the temple ceremony. They were so different in many other ways that it certainly is not a pure imitation. Well, I certainly enjoyed your book. What do you feel like readers are most likely to gather from it? A renewed appreciation of Joseph Smith and who he was? What, what, what do you think that it offers more than other biographies of his life? Well, I hope that explores dimensions of this character that haven't been known before, and I hope it gives Mormons confidence that they can look at all aspects of his record and not feel like there are some shameful uh, items hidden in the closet that don't dare look at. What I would like very much uh, for general readers, perhaps not the Mormons themselves so much, is to appreciate the depth of his religion and his theology, because I think he was a powerful, innovative thinker or revelator, however you choose to call it, uh, and that um, he should take a place in the world as uh, one of the great religious figures of modern times. Do you have future projects planned uh, about Joseph Smith and his life or other Mormon, Mormon books in the works? Well, I've become involved in the Joseph Smith papers. You probably know there's a project afoot to publish all of his papers in perhaps uh, two dozen volumes or so. And I'm helping to edit uh, his journals and his history. That's not full time, but uh, I'm trying to do my part. And how, how long will it be till that project's complete? Well, it's hard to estimate now, but we estimate, uh, we, we think probably 10 to 15 years. Well, big project. Big project. <laughs> Will you be coming to Salt Lake to do book signings at all? I did um, uh, three or four book signings this uh, past fall. I think probably the book signing phase has passed. Mm -hmm. uh, I will, I'm in Salt Lake from time to time, but have none scheduled at the moment. Well, we've been, it's been our privilege to have you with us today, and we really appreciate you being here with us. This interview for our listeners will be uh, online. We appreciate you coming with us today on Christmas Eve and uh, the day after Joseph Smith's 200th birthday. Is there anything else you'd like to say about the book or anything else you'd like to add? Any, anything else important? Um, that, well, uh, I've been fascinated by the comparisons of Joseph Smith to Abraham Lincoln. And because they both come out of nowhere, they both rise to great heights, uh, do unexpected things. And one thing that strikes me is um, how they both have significant deaths. They just don't pass from the scene in a routine fashion. Their deaths punctuate their lives. They underscore their devotion to a great cause, in one case the ending of slavery, preservation of the Union, and in the other uh, the establishment of uh, the Kingdom of God. And I think that Joseph's death turned him from a 
prophet to a hero. Well, thank you very much for coming with us on the air today. We're very grateful to have you here with us. Um, we encourage our listeners to buy a copy of the book, and we encourage our listeners to check back with the show uh, every, every Saturday at 1 o'clock. We'll be here. Thank you again, Professor Bushman, and uh, thank you for coming on the program. Thank you for inviting me. Merry Christmas. Bye. Each week we cover issues of Utah life and history and culture. We talk about issues important to Utah. Today's no different. Mormonism and Joseph Smith certainly play a large part in Utah history. We thank you for being with us today on this Christmas Eve and wish everyone a Merry Christmas who's listening.